All right, guys, we'll get going just because we got three presentations and so we get out on time. So to start off with, we'll have Dr. Becca Ginter talking about systemic vasculitis, the most common consult. <laughs> yes, exactly. All right, so we'll get started. So I'm going to talk today about a systemic vasculitis case uh, with some uncommon <coughs> ocular findings. And as Reese mentioned, this definitely is our most popular consult. Um, and I'll get to a little bit about, you know, kind of uh, why it's important to think about systemic vasculitis and the connections between the eye um, at the end of my talk. So um, this is a, a case, this was a 64-year-old gentleman um, who uh, was initially seen at the VA. And he was referred uh, to the uveitis clinic for possible Bichette's disease. Uh, initially, when he presented to us, he had sudden onset of red eye and some periorbital edema and, and a lot of pain at that time. He actually had a similar episode about four months prior, um, which occurred while he was on Xarelto, and he also had a sudden vision loss at that time. He said that everything was white. And he was seen by an ophthalmologist uh, in Idaho at the time and uh, underwent actually a vitreous tapping inject because they thought maybe he had endophthalmitis, uh, despite the fact that he didn't have any kind of eye surgery or anything that would have led them to think about endophthalmitis. Um, you know, unsurprisingly, the cultures were negative uh, in that case. And uh, he was then subsequently diagnosed with a panuveitis and uh, started on some steroids and also received uh, some uh, topical drops. And he actually uh, was doing a little bit better uh, as he started on the steroids and continued down that steroid taper, which he actually completed prior to seeing us. But his vision was still poor. And then he had this new onset of pain and redness. On review of systems, uh, the only thing really to note was that he did have a cough and um, no hemoptysis with the cough, no production with the cough. And um, he also had a history of a chronic rash on his nose that kind of hadn't really gone away. And he had recurrent epistaxis uh, kind of throughout his life, which had been getting worse. Um, in terms of his medical history, uh, notable for a series of DVTs, he's had a lot of DVTs, some while he was on anticoagulants and some while not. And then he also had uh, multiple uh, PEs. He had a history of cardiac tamponade, and then he also had this history of a nasoceptal perforation, um, which just was not healing. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, important on our, our list of things that we were asking him. And then uh, subsequently, you know, asked about the usual social exposures, nothing really remarkable there. Uh, in terms of his workup, so we were actually lucky that this patient had previously been followed by rheumatology at the VA and had a quite extensive workup that was already done over the past two years as rheumatology was kind of trying to piece together these uh, little bits from his history with the DVTs and the bowel obstructions and the, uh, the nasal septal perforation. So in all of this workup, really the only thing that came back um, slightly notable was the lupus anticoagulant, which uh, rheumatology didn't seem to be able to make a whole lot out of. Um, so in terms of what he looked like on his exam, his vision in the left eye was quite poor. It was 2,500. Right eye vision was normal. Pressures were normal. Um, his anterior segment exam was unremarkable. Um, but his uh, dilated fundus exam in the left eye revealed uh, some large clumps of vitreous um, in the anterior vitreous and also uh, significant, amounts, significant amounts of organized uh, retinal hemorrhage. And uh, there were also some diffuse uh, peripheral intraretinal hemorrhages seen um, on his exam. So um, rather than describe those findings, I'll just show you some photos. So this is a color fundus photograph of the right eye in this patient, which you can see is unremarkable. Um, but the left eye, uh, when we look a little bit closer, we can start to see some of these diffuse hemorrhages. These were actually kind of scattered throughout the periphery. And then uh, some of this uh, dense uh, vitreous hemorrhage infratemporally. So um, we like to do FAs and uveitis, so we got a fluorescein angiogram for this patient. Um, he had a normal arm to retina time, and um, at, as we get further down the line, you can start to see uh, some areas of uh, reduced perfusion, kind of infrotemporally, and then a little bit also supranasally in the early phases. And then as we move along, again, you can start to see these 
areas of uh, intraretinal hemorrhage show up as um, hypoautofluorescent there. And then, um, uh, again, some areas of just a little bit of leakage um, in the superior macula. And then, uh, as you can see, the right eye was um, essentially unremarkable. So in summary, uh, we have a 64-year-old gentleman who's got a history of recurrent uh, venous thromboembolism, both PEs and DVTs. Um, labs only notable for a positive anticoagulant, uh, lupus anticoagulant. And he's got a history of multiple bowel obstructions and a nasal septal perforation. And he's coming in with a unilateral occlusive vasculopathy. So on our differential, we had a couple of things such as a CRVO with a subsequent recanalization since the fluorescein angiogram was not all that remarkable. Um, we also thought about systemic vasculitis and um, in particular, um, you know, if, if it were to be, you know, the antiphospholipid variety based on his laboratory testing, we would expect that to be more of a bilateral presentation. Bichette's disease was, you know, again, thrown out. That was the initial um, uh, consulting request, um, but didn't seem likely given that he didn't have any of the ulcerating mucosal lesions that you would expect to see with Bichette's. Um, and then granulomatosis with polyangiitis was uh, also out there. Um, there is a high risk of thrombotic events in these patients. And uh, we also discussed ocular ischemic syndrome, sarcoid, syphilis, the usual entities, and some type of uh, lymphoma. So um, he, he was referred back to rheumatology after seeing us. Um, he underwent um, an initial uh, PRP in the left eye about a week after we saw him that first time. And then we had, he had some additional workup, again, to kind of try to parse through some of these differential diagnoses. And nothing was remarkable. Um, however, in our discussions with rheumatology, they felt really strongly that this looked like um, an ANCA negative uh, granulomatosis with polyangiitis. So the ANCA testing was not uh, confirmatory in this case, but as we'll discuss a little bit more, um, there are about 10 to 20 percent of uh, GPA cases that uh, end up being ANCA negative. So in, in light of all of these findings, we started him on some prednisone. He didn't have any recurrence of his eye symptoms for at least a few months. And uh, based on our discussions with rheumatology, he was started on methotrexate. So I'd like to talk a little bit about GPA, or granulomatosis with polyangiitis, formerly known as Wegener syndrome. And it was so named because um, Wegener identified several patients in the 1930s who came in with common cold symptoms that then progressed to a systemic inflammatory illness, also with uremia. And um, the clinical features uh, were described, and this, this term was actually coined in the 1950s by Goldman and Churg, um, and those clinical features include different types of necrotizing granulomas. So we get necrotizing granulomas in the respiratory tract that includes the upper and lower respiratory tract. We also get systemic necrotizing vasculitis. And then um, in the kidney, uh, particularly tends to cause a segmental glomerulonephritis. However, um, there are also some incomplete or renal sparing forms which have been described. The peak incidence, uh, our patient was primed for this in uh, the 64 to 75 year old age range. And then ocular findings are, you know, I've read probably about four or five different papers on this subject. They say it can present in 10% to up to 60% of patients. Um, so the most common findings are a focal necrotizing scleritis and uh, keratitis. Those are, you know, that's usually what you see. You can also see some episcleritis. You can see some retrobulbar masses. Um, those of you who have rotated on oculoplastics have probably seen some of these nasolacrimal duct obstructions that can get pretty bad and sometimes require a DCR. Um, but really, uveitis is a pretty rare presentation. Uh, occurs in about 3% according to a couple of the studies that I read. And um, in particular, um, usually presents as an acute anterior uveitis. Panuveitis is even less rare, and then occlusive vasculitis is um, quite rare. Uh, so just to show a couple of the key findings, um, if you are suspecting a patient might have GPA, or if you see these findings, you definitely want to think about it. Um, this is the saddle nose uh, deformity, which occurs because of perforation of the nasal septum and some uh, underlying bony erosion. And you can see that pretty clearly when the patient is lying down. 
And then this is just an example of uh, necrotizing scleritis, um, which uh, if left untreated um, can lead to uh, perforation of the sclera. Pretty rare, um, but it definitely can cause some vision problems. So I wanted to make a couple of uh, sort of brief points for discussion here. Um, and in this patient, we had uh, an initial presentation with multiple venous thromboembolisms, but you know, really his, he didn't have the dramatic sinus disease that we would expect to see in GPA. Um, so just in looking at the association between GPA and really um, any type of systemic vasculitis with venous thromboembolism, um, there are a couple of good studies uh, summarized in this review by Tamaki et al. And they looked at um, uh, one study from the French uh, vasculitis study group where 8% of patients developed uh, DVT or a PE by uh, 60 months of follow-up. So that's pretty significant to consider. And then um, another point of note uh, about the ANCA testing. So in this case, our patient was ANCA negative, but as I mentioned, um, you know, about 80 to 90 percent of patients with, uh, who carry a clinical diagnosis of GPA are actually ANCA positive. And um, that ANCA uh, distribution occurs mostly in the serine protease 3, um, but uh, about 20 percent of cases will be um, myeloperoxidase positive. So we still have 10 to 20 percent of cases that are ANCA negative. And then um, in, ter in terms of the associations between retinal vasculitis and systemic vasculitis, this is something that we get consulted for a lot. And there's a lot of uh, common misconception outside of the ophthalmology community. I know you all know that, you know, the association is not as strong as people think, but um, it's often suspected and actually rarely linked uh, between systemic vasculitis and retinal vasculitis. Um, there was one study that looked at uh, 207 patients um, with retinal vasculitis and found only 1.4 percent of those cases were associated directly responsible um, with a systemic vasculitis. Um, in another study, again, similar findings, um, they looked at, uh, actually they looked at about 1,300 patients with um, systemic vasculitis and uh, uh, retinal vasculitis and found that in 216 patients with systemic vasculitis, only about 16 of those actually had uh, retinal vasculitis that was the cause of their blurred vision. And then lastly, um, in terms of treatment considerations for this patient, um, there was a hot off the press review article um, by Stephen Foster's group um, that looked at uh, rituximab and uh, methotrexate and steroids, and they actually found um, the best induction of remission with rituximab with or without steroids. They found remission in 9 of 14 patients, and these were, these were all patients with a, an ANCA-associated systemic vasculitis. Um, and then uh, out of these um, 22 eyes that they looked at, um, good visual outcome in 17 of 22. So that's, uh, those are pretty good uh, findings and a good suggestion that rituximab might be appropriate for this patient. So just to summarize kind of, this patient actually was initially seen about three years ago and uh, just to summarize what's gone on since that time, um, he did have a drop in his vision um, back in July of 2016. We started him back on steroids. And then in September of 2016, after a lot of discussions with the VA, we got him on rituximab. He underwent two infusions and then subsequently developed a pneumonia, was taken off the methotrexate and the rituximab, and developed a large new vitreous hemorrhage requiring um, a pars plane of vitrectomy and endolaser, and then eventually got him back on the, the methotrexate. He started to do better. And then about uh, a couple months later, developed a decent cataract, uh, thanks to the uh, various interventions that we did. <laughs> and uh, actually, um, Eileen did his cataract surgery last May, and uh, his vision was pretty great afterwards, 2070, compared to 2500. Um, then later, uh, this past summer, he developed a hypopian uveitis, so there's been some ups and downs, um, which responded pretty well to steroids. And then at that time, we started CellCept. And um, uh, in November, he developed a low B cell count, so taken off the CellCept, just to kind of illustrate all of the um, considerations when putting patients on these types of medications. And then lastly, uh, we saw him in December, and he actually developed a new anterior uveitis in the right eye. 
uh, which was a little concerning, and we strongly uh, encouraged rheumatology to consider putting this patient back on rituximab since he seemed to do pretty well while he was on it. So, any questions? Yes, Dr. Harry. Very nice, Becca. Um, just a question Did ENT folks ever do biopsies on these patients? Just kind of blind biopsies? Or like, like That's a good question. They do, and actually, um, the, when he was uh, seen by rheumatology, they referred him to ENT. Um, ENT saw him and said, well, we're not going to do anything about that nasal septal perforation, and he wasn't inflamed enough to get a good biopsy sample, so they opted not to biopsy. But certainly they can, especially if there's a large granuloma there, um, large amounts of sinus disease, they definitely can do a biopsy. And that would sort of be the most... I mean, typically we go after the lung uh, to try to get a good biopsy, but if there are no lung lesions, then we can go for the, um, the sinus disease. Yes. 